Today's podcast is sponsored by one of our favorite products, Almond Cow. We've been using it for well over a year, and I say we, mostly my husband, Mark, who is mooing. Honey, what are your thoughts about Almond Cow? <laughs> this is the moo man. He's back. <laughs> I love the Almond Cow because we know how great it is. Anything that you can make a plant-based milk with, you're set. I don't need to make that much. It's just sitting in the pantry. And then when we're ready, I just make it. It takes a minute. It tastes so good. It tastes so good. And for those of you who are thinking about it, let me tell you why. There are no added preservatives, any kind of artificial stuff. You put in it what you want. You can sweeten it to your taste. It is so easy to make, so easy to clean up. And it's pure gold. It really is. And they give you a lot of recipes on the Almond Cow website. You have the recipe, so you don't have to think, you don't have to go anywhere to find it. It's there for you. Yes, we love it so much. So if you're interested in getting your own, go check out the link or just go to their site, almondcal.co, and you can use code Lara, L-A-R-A, for extra savings. Go get yourself one and have fun. I'm Laura Hyman, and welcome to Redefining Movement, a lit podcast designed to investigate all aspects of movement, from my background in physical therapy and neuroscience. My mission is to help everyone find freedom through smarter movement patterns and compassion for ourselves and others. So together we can live our most uplifted lives, benefiting all beings. Welcome to Friday with Friends. Today, I'm super pumped to have another physical therapist, Betsy Petrie Johnson. But Betsy's not just a physical therapist. She is also a mom of triplets. And if you've been following me for a while, you probably know that I'm a triplet. So we had a lot of common ground there. It's interesting because her own journey and motherhood of having triplets led her to establishing what she's doing now with her Mama Made Strong program. We talk about her struggles after having triplets with not feeling herself and having this distended belly to creating this program that was so needed for moms, for anyone really, but especially if you've felt out of balance in your core, in your pelvic floor, and throughout. So enjoy this wonderful discussion with Betsy. Welcome, Betsy. I am so thrilled to have you on today, and I loved just getting to know you a little bit before we got on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. So I'm just going to read something from your website. I think this would be really a great intro and let you hearken back to this point in time. He said, I was so frustrated. I'd literally spent decades of my life analyzing movement patterns and attempting to break the complex into manageable pieces. Before babies, I competed at U.S. Water Ski Nationals for 20 consecutive years, accumulating 30 top three finishes. Since I was a teenager, I devoted most of my leisure time to either coaching or being coached. Professionally, I had 15 years of experience studying how to make movements both easier and harder. I learned the nuances of developing motor control and the effects of changing position, supports, and gravity. I was board-certified specialist in orthopedics, and yet I could not solve my own problems. I felt completely disconnected from my body and had no idea who to talk to or how common my experience was. I just believed that somewhere there were answers. Somewhere in the middle of that, I solved my own mysteries. So can you take us back to this time period? You were a PT already. You obviously clearly were an athlete. What were the problems that you were having? So we were living in England when my babies were born, and I had to learn the healthcare system both as a provider and as a recipient of healthcare over there. It's very different. Initially, when we moved there, I was looking for a job, and I was debating going the socialized medicine route or the private practice medicine route, and I ended up going private practice. I had a great employer. I genuinely liked him as a person. As opposed to in this country where I showed up and I had work, in that country, he was trying to compete with the socialized system. So he was trying to bring in clients and he was asking us, basically, what are your marketing strategies? And I was like, nobody's ever asked me that before. So I didn't have any marketing strategies. (laughs) And so then I was trying to think, like, how do we let people know that they need this? And so I was like, pregnant women are a really underserved population. And he was like, no, that's fine. We'll go what works for you. So then I found out that I was pregnant with triplets and I am totally out of my league. Baby is a completely foreign language at its best in your own country. I was in England. It's not like it was a completely different language, but it was a different language. Baby in that country is not the same as baby in this country. 
my boss's wife sat me down and wrote out a list. It was like a translation. Like this is the English word for baby item number one. And this is the American word. After my babies were born, I felt like I had swallowed a basketball hole. My belly was so large. I could have easily been six months pregnant. I actually had two miscarriages. I always tell this part of my story because I feel like when you're in that boat, you need hope. And I had two miscarriages that were both spontaneous pregnancies, that were both spontaneous miscarriages, and then I had spontaneous triplets. As we were talking about being a triplet myself, having triplets naturally without any hormonal support or anything is really rare. My husband and I both Googled it when we found out that was the boat we were in, and we were told one in 8,000. I understood why my belly would be so large, but it felt hard and weird. And that part was just foreign to me and I couldn't get it to change shape. And people kept saying to me like, oh, this is normal. It'll go back. And I was like, I don't agree with you. Like, I don't know why, but intuitively, I don't think this thing is just going to go away on its own. Well, I'm going to start trying to find my abs again and I'm going to start rebuilding slowly. Like, this is a concept I get. I've come back from injuries before. Like, I've walked all kinds of people through all kinds of scenarios like this. I know how to rebuild. And I couldn't rebuild. I can remember laying on the floor trying to do a single leg bridge. If I keep doing this, I'm going to hurt myself. This is not going the way I want it to go. And I didn't know who to ask because I was not living in my country. The person who had the more expertise than I did that I knew that it was a physio was a man who was like, we are not doing pregnant women. And I was like, okay, he's not got my answer. The socialized system over there, like the driver in continuing education is not nearly as good as our driver in the States, in my opinion. Here, we want to be better than the next provider. So we want to have the answers somebody else doesn't have. And because it's socialized, they're just trying to move people through the system. Like they're showing up in this socialized system regardless because they need care. And it doesn't matter if you're better than the next person because they're still going to be there. And so I was giving like seminars in services to my coworkers on the continuing eds that I had in this country because they were like, we've never seen this stuff. What are you talking about? And for sure, there's somebody here in this country who knows more about it than I do, but I don't know where they are. I don't know who they are. I don't know how to find them. And I don't have much childcare. So even if they were like a walk down the street, how often can I go and see them? Who's going to come watch my three newborns for me? I don't know what to do. I am not the first person who's had this problem or asked this question. There are answers to this. So I got online and I tried like a postpartum program that I'd heard other moms talk about. I'm maybe moving a little bit more because I'm not having to think of the ideas. Somebody's just shoveling them out in front of me and I'll go and do that. It hasn't gotten me where I want to go. It's fine, but it still hasn't answered my questions. And so then I was like, well, maybe it's not a postpartum program. So then I tried another online program about building strength, body weight specific. And I was like, always intrigued by body weight movement. And again, I liked it. I felt like it was a good program, but I was still missing something. I was like, this is not it. This is not my issue. And so I was like, what are physical therapists telling women in physical therapy after babies? What is the answer in that scenario? I can't go and see one. I don't know even who I would go to see where I'm living in this super rural area where I don't know providers treating these clients or these patients. But what would they say? And so then I started looking into continuing education for postpartum clients and for physical therapists who treat postpartum clients. And that's when I really started finding my answers. And I realized that when I was in physical therapy school, it was like pelvic floors contract and they relax. And if you can do that, you don't have pelvic floor problems. But if you want to talk about it, you can go talk about it with those people over there because nobody else talks about that. And so I didn't. And I was like, I can feel it lift. I can feel it lower. I don't have a problem. I'm going to go do something that sounds way more exciting than that. But then I realized how much I did not know about breathing and pelvic floor function. I am not a pelvic floor physical therapist. I am an orthopedic physical therapist who speaks pelvic floor. But I feel like pelvic floor physical therapy is such an amazing niche and helps in so many obscure situations and run-of-the-mill situations where people just aren't getting the right information. But I also feel like orthopedic physical therapists aren't talking about pelvic floors enough and we need to merge the worlds. They overlap each other so much. And so that's kind of the space that I hope to live in, to be able to speak public floor and to be able to understand the ortho components and to be able to tie those together because there's such a disconnect in my mind. And that's what I was missing because really I had had public floor problems all my life and I didn't know. Right. And you mentioned that when you really started to look into your movement patterns 
and your history that it went all the way back to six or seven. Yeah. So I was a kid in the 80s and my dad was riding a bike where he had like just a flat part over top of the fender. It wasn't an actual child seat. It was just a flat seat. And I knew as a four-year-old that when I rode on the back of the bike with my dad, I was not to let my feet down. But for whatever reason, I did. I let my feet down and my left foot went through the spokes of the bike while my dad was pedaling. So it just took my foot around the pedal stroke with my dad. It didn't break anything. It supposedly sprained my ankle. I don't remember a ton about it and my mom doesn't give a great history of it, but I had to have been not walking for a period of several weeks. And when I went back to walking, I just didn't go back to walking in a normal way because in unraveling it all, everything is turned right. And I have to learn to turn left because it was my left foot. And so I just shifted away from it. But not only did I like change my movement, but literally like my brain's understanding of the left side of my body changed. So like when I was in high school, and I was learning about visualization with sports, and I would try to visualize, I had two right sides in my mind. Like when I would close my eyes and think it through, and I did not have a left. And I had to think, wait a minute, that's not right. Why don't you have a left side? Why can't you even think left side? I couldn't even imagine it. For decades, I knew I was asymmetrical. I knew I was uneven, but I didn't know why, and nothing I could do seemed to change it, and I couldn't figure out why. And the why was because I had shifted away from that left side and it changed my pelvic floor function, my hip function, my ab function, my back function, my foot function, like all of it. Yeah. And can you just briefly speak about how the foot ankle connects up through to the pelvic floor, why it's affecting the pelvic floor? So I like to describe the hip and the foot as opposite ends of the same stick. What your foot does is going to affect what your hip does, and what your hip does is going to affect what your foot does. Your hip and your pelvic floor are like best friends. Depending on how you categorize the muscles, they even shear muscles. Some of them that are hip are also pelvic floor, et cetera. So you can't have a dysfunction in your hip and not also have a dysfunction in your pelvic floor. They have to work together. So if something's going on in one, something's going on in the other. And if your hip is not moving in an effective way, it's going to have downstream effects to your foot. And so then you go to change your hip, you change your pelvic floor, you're working on rebuilding this core, but you haven't changed the foot. You've still put it on top of this foot that's learned to be dysfunctional. So then you have to also address how the foot moves. The same thing that goes through all throughout our spine, our whole body, it's just so fed together. And honestly, like that's one of the things that I really love about yoga. Yoga has been so revealing to me when I think through, okay, here's a movement on one side. Here's the movement on the other side. That's not the same. It just creates such awareness. How are you going to change that so that it is more similar? And maybe it's not exactly the same today. That's the thing about yoga practice is it's not this thing that you randomly do. But when you consistently practice, a little bit of change today becomes a significant change weeks down the road. And you're like, I'm not nearly as wonky as I used to be. Yeah, I love that. And I think it's also something that is not always necessarily taught in PT school. I had a wonderful kinesiology teacher who really just set a stage of that understanding of integration and movement and that everything is ultimately connected. And then we had a deep discussion and academic focus on the fascial systems as well. But I came out in rehab and really I was doing stuff that other people weren't doing. And then of course I learned much more because I went on to become NDT certified. Of course, our medical system compartmentalizes everything. It's like, this is an ankle issue. I think it'd be better to be like, this is an imbalance issue. There's a lot going on here and we're going to address it all in a more comprehensive way. And so you developed your program, which I love, Mama Made Strong. And of course, I love that you said mama because I feel like that's a Southern word. I was having this discussion with my mom the other day. Are you from the South? I am. That's what my grandmother used to say. My grandmother, to me, she called herself grandmama. Even though my mother called herself mom to me, when's your mama coming to pick you up? How's your mama doing today? And my grandmother always said that. And I lost my grandmama before I became a mother. And so, yes, it is definitely an ode to my grandmother because she always said your mama. But also because I feel like mama works in multiple different languages. I learned when we were living in England, over there it's mom, over here it's mom. Different cultures use different words. Mother is a bit formal to me. But mama, I liked it in part because of my grandma, but in part because I felt like it had like a hominess. 
Yeah. That's what my daughter calls me and she's 21. It's so affectionate. And it's also got this camaraderie, like I'm mama made strong. So tell us about this program. It sounds like from when I was looking up stuff, I kept on thinking, oh my God, we have so much in common because similar to you, I started bridging the gap between yoga and PT and experimented with a group of my clients and then got feedback. And it sounds like you did the same thing. Yeah. The programs that I was encountering that existed on the internet were kind of along the lines of do these exercises for two to three to four weeks and then do these exercises for two to three to four weeks. And there was nothing wrong with the exercises. They were great exercises, but it really only works if you're doing them in a way that's effective. And if they're the right exercises for your scenario, because some people need to learn to recruit their pelvic floor more as part of their strategy. And other people need to learn to recruit their pelvic floor less as part of their strategy. And if it needs to be less, it's really hard to tell people don't. So you have to tell them what to do instead. And then it depends on the person. What is their other do? Is it their abs? Is it their hips? Is it their feet? Is it their breathing? Like there's so many things to consider. As a physical therapist, we're kind of always taught like you need to evaluate the person and then you need to give them a treatment plan based on your findings and they need a prognosis. And we have this system that we're taught for how to tailor it to the individual, but you can't tailor it to the individual in an online program where you may or may not interact with that person. When my babies were small, I had a lot of time to think and not a lot of time to do. So that's what I did, wander around with their stroller. And so that was my brainstorm. What if I teach them to assess their own function. They don't have to do a PT evaluation. A lot of them have been to PT already. They might know some of these basics, but I teach them to assess their current function so that they understand the strategy that they are using right now. And the strategy that they are using right now gets the results that they are having right now. And so if we want different results, we need a different strategy. And so then based on their findings, then I offer them other strategies. If you are somebody who is not recruiting your pelvic floor enough, what happens if I teach you how to recruit your pelvic floor and then I teach you how to tie it to this very foundational movement? How does that change your symptoms? And we don't obviously start at pelvic floor, we start at breathing. But as you layer on the components of rebuilding a solid core, then you develop a new strategy and you get different results and it teaches them to find a path. I like to tell them like, Instead of a cookie cutter approach, it's choose your own adventure. I want to share with you a little secret I have. This secret is this amazing skincare line that I've been using now for a year. Now, I am a product queen. It is the one thing I spend money on. I don't spend a lot of money on clothes, but I love products. And I love skincare products because I want my skin to really reflect and showcase how I feel inside. But this is honestly the best product I've ever tried. And I love the fact that it's vegan. It's all natural. You could literally eat it because it's totally organic. Herbal face food. It's the most potent anti-aging, multi-correction, antiviral skincare on the market. It's magic. I can't even describe it. I use a little bit of Serum One a few times a week and it tightens up my skin. And then it also kind of whitens it a little bit, makes it feel like all the sun damage disappears. But you can go for the serum two, which is like the correction, and that goes into the more sun-damaged areas. So you're just going to have to try it for yourself. So go to the show notes and hit the link. Lara 20 is the code for 20% off herbal face food. I love it. I want to share it with you all. And the other thing, it's really getting people to understand themselves. Because if they're asked questions that they have to actually figure out It's directing the question, but it's personalizing what the result is. I think that's what's missing. And people sometimes don't realize if an online program is done in this really intelligent way, dare I say it could be more effective than like a clinical setting because you're limited. I honestly think this is the digital world that we are living in. And especially with COVID insurance issues and childcare issues and access issues, like we have to rethink care. And I totally did not expect this. When I was in a clinic, people came to me and they wanted me to fix them. And they wanted me to be magical. And I was supposed to have the answer. Those are the personalities that are in this profession anyway. That's why we're there. Because we are givers. I wanted to deliver. And so often, I felt disappointed with the experience for both of us. Because I felt like I hadn't been magical enough. 
And I wasn't always sure if it was me or if it was the implementation. And that's one of the things that I found on accident about my program is like, nobody expects magic from me anymore. They know I am not in the same space with them. I can't touch them and fix this thing. And it puts so much more of the onus on them that then they either go, you know what, this isn't for me, which is totally fine. Or they're putting in a lot more effort on their end to solve problems and it gets better results. And I feel like it's more satisfying to me as a provider to have conversations with people and to be like, okay, so what did you figure out about this? And then I can talk them through, well, if this happens, then try that. And if the other happens, then try this. But it's got to be this scenario or that scenario. And we can talk through the whys and the possibilities, but their ownership of it and their active role and their ability to problem solve is so much fun. Yeah. And I think biggest take home for this to me is what I try and teach every day, which is for better or for worse, you're in charge of you. You are in charge of your health. We have all these amazing systems, physical therapy, wonderful hospitals and all that. But at the end of the day, in and day out, it's up to you. And I'm always surprised that everyone doesn't realize how much they are the biggest player. They're the author of their story. Yeah. So I've decided that there are people in this world who just thrive on movement. They just seek it out. Their day is going to have it in it, regardless of whether or not somebody tells them to. They are going to move and it might look like different things at different stages of their lives, but they seek out movement. And there are other people who don't. I was having a conversation with my sister-in-law and I was like, you can make anything. Just tell me what you like to do and I will tell you how to make it a core exercise. I think that those of us who seek out movement have an advantage. There's no level of commitment. We don't have to buy in. We don't have to make ourselves do it. We will seek it regardless of anything else. It's the people who don't feel that way about movement who have to make a conscious effort to create this practice, to force themselves to do it, to hopefully eventually create a love for it, but maybe not. And that's a lot harder. I think it's those people who don't automatically have it where it's revolutionary, it's eye-opening, that really is on them because they're consumed by the things that their brain enjoys more. That's such a good point. We only know what we know, which is you're the same as me. I was born into this personality and body that loves movement and feels all the things when I don't move. It's like so connected to my mood. And I always wonder like, how could somebody just sit and craft all day? I would go nuts. Your body has to do a little something besides just sit in a chair and weld to the chair. I find this in the corporate setting is just trying to find opportunities and make it like an exploration. Because unfortunately, those people in particular aren't going to really know how detrimental the lack of movement is until it could be years or even decades. And P.S., it's never too late. And I love what you said, whether you are postpartum three months or 30 years, this program will help. And I think that is another thing I'd love for you to talk about. If you were to look at the breakdown, like how many people are you getting early postpartum versus years later? I think that's such an interesting concept because I feel like people a lot of times look at my program or at my business name as Mama Made Strong and they're like, well, I'm not postpartum. But I have people who are not mothers and they're like, you know something that I need to know, so I need to talk to you. And they just pick up your message. I am not saying do this, which is a lot easier for a very tired mother brain to handle. I honestly don't see that many super early postpartum. Sometimes I do. But I more often have people whose kids are two and three or older, or I have people who are menopausal or postmenopausal because that change in hormones creates a whole other set of changes and need to understand. I would say I'm one of those two categories because people tend to find me after they've tried other things and gotten frustrated. And they're like, I went to pelvic floor PT. I did the things. I didn't solve my problems. You're talking about something different. What are you talking about? And so I don't necessarily get that many early ones, but the business and the name and the inspiration all came out of that experience for me. Whether your kids are 30 or three, you're still their mama. Yeah, you're still postpartum. It's like being a child and being an adult. And you might be a young adult or you might be an older adult. I think that's really interesting because I think a lot of early postpartum, you're so tired, so exhausted. I think we often just are like, this is just the way it's going to be. Like I just had a baby three months ago or 12 months ago and things are shifting and almost writing it off to that and not realizing that 
there are some things that can happen even in an early stage that can help reestablishing that center and that alignment that is really important. Like I'd love to hear your take on posture because when people talk about posture, they're thinking like, oh, you got to walk around like in the military. And that's an idea of what posture conjures up for you. But posture is way more than that. That's an idea. Of course, nobody wants to be rigid. So posture matters because it's how you inhabit your body and the space and the alignment. If the rib cage is balanced over the pelvis and is the pelvis dipping forward. So tell me about your thoughts on that. So I think that posture or alignment or however you want to describe it is very significant. Sometimes I try not to use the word posture because people have a predisposed idea of what I mean. And other times I use the word posture because I'm like, well, if I say alignment, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Have I lost you because I used a different word? It's so significant to speak the language of the people that you're talking to and then refine. When you're pregnant, there are all these drivers that create the pregnant posture. And they're important and they're significant because your hormones are changing, the baby is growing, and the baby has to go somewhere. It can't grow down or backwards or up. It has to grow out. That's the only choice for it. If the baby just kept growing out and you didn't shift your posture in order to balance that out, you would literally fall over on top of that baby. <laughs> and so evolution has taught us to come up with a different strategy. And so we do because we have to compensate for this baby that's growing out in front of us. But after that baby is born, the same drivers don't exist. There is nothing that goes, okay, now it's gone. You need to revert back to something else, maybe something that you did before, maybe something different. Nothing makes you revert back except for conscious effort. Postpartum mothers are so caught up in adjusting to this new life and how to incorporate this in their family and what this exactly means that their focus just isn't on themselves. And so then they get two or three or five or 20 years down the road and they're like, I don't think this is right. And I feel like it started back then and they tell you some story. Everybody's got this scenario that stands out in their minds. And that scenario usually happened decades ago. <laughs> Maybe it's years, but a lot of times it's a really long time ago. Sometimes it's before pregnancy and then they were wrapped up in it. And then now years down the road, they're like, I think this is still a problem that I never fixed from. And they tell you this story. And so my take on it is there is not a driver that makes you go back to a more effective strategy. So instead, we have to consider where are you right now? What are you doing? And what are the other options? Because we need a new strategy. We need to get a different outcome. So to get a different outcome, we need a different input. Who are we going to change? Which aspect of this? And to go back to your question about alignment, a big part of core function is having your diaphragm stacked on top of your pelvic floor. If your rib cage is tilted one direction or the other, or if your pelvis is tucked or tilted one direction or the other, shift it off to the side. If you're twisted, there's so many different options. And those changes in your rib cage and your pelvis position change the ability of your diaphragm and your pelvic floor to communicate with each other. And when they're not communicating with each other, then your core function isn't going to be as effective. If you imagine a gymnast, if you watch like Simone Biles, she's not functioning with her rib cage stacked over her pelvis. She is not learning a new strategy a few months postpartum or trying to change years of habits that began in those early days postpartum, she's functioning at a different level. And when you get to that level, you can put your pelvis and your ribcage in whatever position you want to also, but we have to start in a place that makes sense. To build that foundation, you need to connect your diaphragm and your pelvic floor. So we got to start with it stacked and then you can progress to anywhere that you want to be. It's not that we're going to all function like this because you got to get the car seat out of the car too. Yes. And that's the whole thing I think about core and finding that alignment is it improves your ability to respond to when you like step off the curb, your pelvis isn't going to just be jammed. You're going to have a responsiveness to that. And that's going to become more of a reflex that you want to have. And when you're not in that alignment and the connection between the diaphragm and the pelvic floor and all the other elements of the core, you can't have the same response. And in fact, maybe one area is going to only participate. I often talk about rowers because I worked with Olympic rowers and I said, like, imagine you have a boat of six people and only two are doing the work and the rest are drinking beer. At some point, those two are going to get really ticked off. They're just doing all the work. And that's kind of like the participation of the core muscles. There's many more than six, but they need to collaborate. And so the structure of a more 
understanding of alignment and posture allows that collaboration to happen. And when muscles are like too short or too lengthened, it's hard to get a hold of them. It's hard to get them to contract well. But when you put them at mid-range, you have more choices and they can lengthen and they can shorten and it gets easier to access them. And so that's another thing that stacking your ribcage over your pelvis allows you to do so that you can access those muscles because there are probably muscles that are like those rowers that are just drinking their beer and not playing along. You're not even aware of them and you can't find them until you get things in mid-range and then you can create that awareness. And once you have that awareness, then you can keep an eye on rower number three, regardless of what position that you're in versus just in this perfect alignment. But you have to find them first. You have to know which one is drinking the beer. Exactly. (laughs) Those are the moments when people are like, what was that I just felt? It's like they are hearkening or awakening dormant muscles. And of course, they're not dormant. They're dormant in their activity and in terms of the demands. It's so great when people are so used to using just the rectus abdominis or primarily, and they're like, oh, I feel really tight up here. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I actually feel more stuff coming on. So my final question, because this is always such a noise around it, I think, is DR and diastasis recti. And what are your thoughts? Because obviously you said, was it four and a half fingers? Like I could put my fist. Which makes sense when you have triplets in there and they were decent size. And my mom had an umbilical hernia where hers ended up. Anybody that's listening, Betsy has the same setup that I was, which is so amazing as the mother and now I'm the kid, but there was me and then my identical brothers. So the identical share a placenta usually, and they are often going to be smaller because of that. And then the single like me was bigger and I was almost eight pounds. And I always said, mom, what did you think? And she goes, I was a little depressed. That's a lot to take in and absorb. And she had a two-year-old at the time. So she adjusted though, as you did, I'm sure. So anyway, let's go back to your experience and what is your take on it now? And I feel like that fear producing is not good for moms. I would totally agree with you. That's what happens after you have babies. You just have a belly that looks like that. To understanding that a diastasis is a thing. Now I feel like we're so wrapped up in the idea that there's a diastasis that it's gotten lost in the messaging that the diastasis is also a symptom. The diastasis isn't the problem. The problem is the management of the internal pressure. And so if you're experiencing leaking or back pain or diastasis or heaviness, any of those things, they're not being caused by the diastasis. The diastasis does not cause back pain or leaking. The issues with internal pressure management causes all of those things. I feel like we've swayed the pendulum too far the other direction because it was like, there's nothing you can do. You have to learn how to manage pressure and managing pressure will change your diastasis and it will change your leaking and it will change your pain and it will change all of the other things. But it's not about changing your diastasis. The focus shouldn't be on that. The focus should be on learning how to manage internal pressure in an effective way. And your body can't be like, oh, that's the right amount of pressure. The way that it gives you feedback is whether or not you get leaking or whether or not your diastasis gets deeper or whether or not your diastasis bulges or whether your belly has the right shape. You know, social media is good and it's bad. And I see so much messaging that's like, we can't get so focused on the shape of a woman's belly because it shouldn't be. It doesn't ultimately matter. But at the same time, if a woman wants to have a belly that's a different shape or If she understands that the shape of her belly is an indication of how effective her core strategy is, then using the shape of her belly can be an excellent biofeedback tool to guide her down the path that she needs to be on. If I took my belly out of the equation, if I didn't use my belly for feedback, I would be totally lost. Even now, I still exercise with my hands on my belly, with my hands on my ribs. I'm the same way. And you're looking at it as investigation. This isn't like a judgment. And I don't want people to look at their belly or put their hand on their belly because I want them to be ashamed by the shape of their belly. No, I want them to understand that is their body giving them information about what's going on with their internal pressure in that particular exercise. And if they don't want to look at it, then that's their decision. They get to not look at it. But it is a big way of understanding what's going on to help guide you to learn a new strategy to be more effective. And I would be totally lost without it in my body. The idea that the goal is to reduce the diastasis or get it to a certain number is a bit misplaced. The diastasis gives you feedback from the sense of, can you create tension across it? 
versus it sinking in or bowing out? Can you narrow it or let it gap? Because your rectus abdominal muscles will actually narrow it versus your transverse abdominal muscles will actually gap it. But we want more transverse abs. There's got to be a healthy balance there. And it's not like I'm less concerned about how far apart it is that you can make your abs participate in the way that you intend with whatever move that you're doing. And over time, your diastasis is going to change. But how you measure it is so variable to begin with. If you're somebody who's like regularly testing it to understand your progress and you haven't gained that ability yet, you might be upsetting yourself or scaring yourself by testing it when the goal is not necessarily that it measure less than two or that it be exactly whatever, so much as that you can control the pressure in an effective way. Nobody does it right all the time. So that's not really the goal either. That was great. I could talk to you forever. I really could just with all of this. It really is applicable to so many people, like how we function in an integrative way. So how can people find out more about your program? I am Mama Made Strong, M-A-M-A, Made Strong at Instagram. My website, www.mamamadestrong.com. I'm Mama Made Strong on Facebook, although I'm not on Facebook very much. Instagram and my website mainly. Love it. Everybody check out the website in particular. There's a blog. There's so much guidance. There's great questions to get you thinking about what part of the program would be helpful. So everyone check that out. And thank you so much for your time and your knowledge and just everything. Thank you for the opportunity. I love talking to you and I love hearing the perspective of a triplet. Oh yeah. We all turned out well and mom did too. As I said before, my mom is amazing. It's a different world, but it is our version of parenthood. (laughs) Yes, it is. So thank you so much. And for everyone who's listening, as always, I'm pulling for you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Redefining Movement. If you like what you've heard, please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Feel free to leave us a rating and review or share with someone you know. Check us out at www.litmethod.com.